What's up YouTube and welcome to the next episode of my collecting goals series. Today we're going to take a look at a subset I recently completed for the PS1 and it is all the Marvel related games for the system. So one thing I really like about this Marvel games on the system is that it really feels like this is the last pure console for uh, Marvel games before they really became a big cash grab opportunity. They were all related to movie tie-ins or kids series and other corporate tie-ins such as Lego Marvel games that you got on much uh, consoles that followed the PS1 generation. Primarily the games you're going to see in this video were really intended for Marvel's core audience of the late 90s which was actual comic book geeks. <laughs> Not people that were tied to uh, blockbuster movies and really looking for a summer action movie tie-in that they could get the video game of and bring home. Um, with that being said, though, a lot of the games in this series are a pretty much a mixed bag. Um, part of that being due to probably lower budgets that were uh, really a part of development for these games as compared to any kind of Marvel-related game that comes out today where it's you know always a big blockbuster title or something that's tied into another well-known franchise that makes it easy uh, to be a top-selling release. So with that, um, I do want to go through the games that are related to Marvel Comics characters that are on the PS1. Just know that some of these are not necessarily my favorites. I'm not endorsing every game that's in this video, but I did think it was a fun subset to put together. So we're actually going to start off with the game that I'm least familiar with uh, of the character of any game in, the, in this whole subset, and that is Blade. Um, this one is kind of one of the rare exceptions that we're going to take a look at, and that this is related to a movie tie-in um, of the comic book character Blade. Um, obviously the Wesley Snipes movie, which I never saw. <laughs> so to this day I have not seen the movie, uh, but I have played the game a little bit. This one um, came out later in the PS1 life than many of the games we're going to take a look at here. And really it should be a, probably one of the more polished releases. Um, this one is, I don't know, okay. I was playing it a little bit today. It's a 3D action game. Um, it just seems to be incredibly dark as far as the, uh, the visuals of the game. I actually had to turn the brightness of my TV up to be able to play this game. And it just kind of detracted from it. Obviously Blade is a vampire, so you would expect it to be kind of dark and gritty, and this one is a mature rated title, which I think it might be the only mature rated title in this whole uh, video. Um, I thought it was okay. I guess if the, you know, licensed character wasn't there, the game would probably play the same. It wouldn't really have any major effect um, to the game design. So one thing I noticed about this one, um, this one was published by Activision. Um, typically that's a good sign as far as most of the Marvel PS1 games, if they're Activision related, they tended to be a little bit better. But one thing I noticed on the back of this one is this was developed by a team that I'd never even heard of with an Activision called Hammerhead. So, I don't know, maybe this is a one-off game, or maybe they did some other titles that I'm just not aware of. Um, but overall, I would say this one isn't necessarily a classic for the system. Um, but, you know, again, if you're going for all the Marvel titles, it's, it's part of the set. Uh, next, we're going to kind of rewind the clock and look at some of the earlier titles that uh, were Marvel games for the PS1. Some of these were, you know, franchises that were probably well known to comic geeks, but, you know, since we didn't have movies or anything to tie these to, these wouldn't have had too much appeal outside of that core audience. So this is Fantastic Four, obviously one of Marvel's uh, longest running titles. I'm not really a huge Fantastic Four fan. Um, obviously it has some recognizable characters in it. You got The Thing, um, you know, Human Torch, Mr. Fantastic, so on and so forth. Um, this one is kind of unique in that it is a uh, beat-em-up, actually, which is, you know, typically a franchise that lends well to superhero games. Um, it is pretty crude, <laughs> is what I will say about this one. Uh, this was developed by a company called Probe, uh, which doesn't really have a good reputation, and this one doesn't do anything for that. Um, they did try some things here, I guess, to make this a little bit more exciting. Uh, one thing that is pretty critical to this is that since it is the Fantastic Four, this game actually does support uh, four-player mode. So you can plug in a PS1 multi-tap and actually have all four players uh, playing at the same time, which is pretty cool, you know, for the time. Um, overall, it's, uh, you know, 2D, uh, 3D characters on a 2D scrolling uh, beat-em-up plane. Um, the character design is, is pretty ugly, to be honest, as far as the, uh, the the protagonist as well as the enemies you fight in the game. Um, just not a very attractive looking game, and um, you know, for an early PS1 game, I would say it's even rather crude for that. Uh, what I thought was kind of weird about this one is it has a very funk soundtrack to it that doesn't seem to fit the game at all. 
And then the other thing that was really weird about this one is, uh, I guess due to the excessive loading times that <laughs> exist between the levels, it has like a uh, ripoff of Super Sprint, the overhead arcade top-down racer. Uh, that you play in between stages and you can just it's kind of like the early uh, Namco games on PS1 where you can just play like Galaxian in between stages So honestly, I probably had more fun playing the little super sprint ripoff than the actual game And you can just keep playing it uh, and then just decide whenever you're ready to resume the regular game and start playing that so I Don't really know what that came from maybe just some developer boredom, but uh, that's just a nice little sub feature that this game has so Anyways, we'll move on um, this one is by no means a classic uh, then we move to uh, The Incredible Hulk, which is obviously another very recognizable Marvel character. Uh, this is The Incredible Hulk and the Pantheon Saga. Um, I've read a little bit of Hulk comic books. I'm not familiar with that uh, storyline. I assume it came directly from the comics. But uh, overall, this game is... Ooh, it's pretty rough. Um, this one was developed by Eidos, and it was a sub-team uh, within Eidos. I'm trying to remember what they were called. It's not anybody I'd ever recognized before. This was by no means an A title. Um, it's a 3D uh, action game, and uh, there's some heavy, like, box-pushing platforming, which doesn't really seem to fit the theme at all. Um, the music in this one is pretty lousy, and, um, you know, you do get to smash a lot of things, which I guess is pretty core to the Hulk experience, but uh, I don't think this one's a classic by any means. Um, this one also came out on the Saturn. I don't think it's really any noticeably different on that system either. I've played that one a little bit and um, seems to be pretty much the same thing as this one. So uh, cannot recommend the Hulk. You know, again, this is just kind of interesting because if you think about Hulk games that came out later on, they became more of that like big budget movie tie in experience. This was more just, you know, crude. Let's pay a developer to, to, to make a Hulk game. Not probably a whole lot of thought that went into this one. So can't re recommend that one either, but uh, it is you know, part of the subset, of course. Uh, then we have Iron Man XO Manowar in Heavy Metal. A uh, very convoluted title. Uh, this one is another Acclaim published title, which is not a good thing. And uh, the developer on this one I'd never heard of. Um, they're called Real Time Associates. Whatever. <laughs> um, probably the best way I could describe this game is it's like a walk-in gun. Um, there's no running involved whatsoever, because obviously both characters move rather slow in their big mech suits. Um, they did try to do some things with the, uh, you know, Iron Man's boosting that were kind of commendable you know, to make the character, I guess, more loyal to the comic books. Um, but the game just moves so slow. And uh, again, dark visuals with this one, too. I think uh, kind of a common trait that the Blade had as well. Um, this one's a very early PS1 game. And one thing that really shows it's <laughs> how early of a PS1 game is... Uh, you know, with these early PS1 games, you obviously don't get DualShock support or analog control. That's a given. Uh, but this one doesn't even support the memory card. So uh, get ready for 26 character passwords <laughs> that you have to write down for each stage. Um, I was just kind of laughing as those screens came up. And I'm like, this is such uh, a bygone era of having to write down pass passwords, especially in the PS1 era when... Clearly, they could have just added memory card support. But um, this one also exists on the Saturn. Again, I don't think it's any better on the Saturn, but uh, you could pick your poison as far as which one you prefer. Um, I guess of this versus the last couple games I showed, I would probably prefer this one the best of the three, but uh, all of these are definitely very early and uh, low-budget PS1 games that were farmed out to undesirable developers and then published by also undesirable publishers. So not a whole lot of good things to say about any of those. Um, then we get into some bright spots, so trust me, there are some good reasons to play Marvel games on PS1. Um, Capcom got involved, thankfully, and uh, brought us some good 2D fighting games. Uh, the PS1 versions are not known to be the best of these. If you can, please play these on the Saturn. They typically play faster, have more frames of animation, and uh, take advantage of the Saturn memory cart in some cases. Uh, this one does support the Saturn 1 megabyte memory card, so even that has a little advantage over this one. Um, but anyways, it is a highly playable um, mix of Marvel characters that you get in this in a 2D fighting game. And uh, this is the first and only, well, as far as some of the other games that are part of the subseries, it's the only way you can play Captain America on the PS1. So there is no standalone Captain America game if you're a fan of them. Um, but then you do have other recognizable X-Men, Spider-Man type characters um, throughout the game. 
And, um, you know, really fast playing game. These games were really fun when they first came out in the arcades. Um, obviously, the PS1 translations are watered down a little bit, but it's very welcome to have these. Um, I did have this game, probably one of the only ones I bought new of this whole group, um, but I did end up selling my original copy and then I rebought this one a few years later. So nice to have this, and like I said, it's um, a, a good representation of Marvel characters you get in this game. Um, they obviously expanded from here and some of the other ones I'm going to show you, and uh, also games that came later in the series, uh, but this was a, you know one of the earlier versus fighters that showed up pretty well. Um, if you've seen some of my other videos on Capcom fighting games, you've seen the Fighter's Edge subset. Uh, I just wanted to show that there is a variant cover of Marvel Super Heroes, so if you're interested, you can pick this one up. It's the same game otherwise, but uh, does have slightly different cover art, so just that one does exist. Um, after Marvel Super Heroes, a little bit later, we got Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. Um, obviously just expanding the universe a little bit. You have your Marvel characters, but also facing off versus uh, classic Street Fighter characters as well. Um, this one I didn't really get as attached to. I think it just was a little bit, um, you know, not enhanced too much over the last game. And um, overall, it does try to do the tag team battles, but even that is a little bit watered down um, on the PS1. So this one I can also recommend on the Saturn um, if you have a chance to play that one. But, uh, you know, obviously it's cool that it exists in the PS1 library. Uh, the other thing I don't like about this one is the cover on this one is so bland. You've got these great characters from both universes, and they don't even put any of them on the cover. Uh, and this is only comes in a Fighter's Edge variant, uh, version, so there is no no variant of this one, unfortunately. But uh, just thought I would mention the, <laughs> the blandness of the cover as well. Um, then this one came out a little bit later. This is Marvel vs. Capcom Clash of Superheroes. Um, again, kind of more of the same, just another versus fighter. This one... Um, probably is, is recommended to have on the Dreamcast, because it came out a little bit later in that generation. Uh, but it does play, you know, very quick. Um, they did try to, you know, again, mix up the, the characters in this. They added a few more from the Marvel Universe, and then obviously a lot from all Capcom franchises, not just Street Fighter. So if you're into that, you can definitely check this one out. And then, um, obviously, the sequel to this is much better known and more appreciated, but that's only on the Dreamcast and other later systems that came out after this. So... Nice that we got those. Like I said, Capcom gave um, the system quite a bit of love by bringing us all these Marvel characters in a, a more representative form. Also, just the fact that they were 2D, I think, was appreciated because those early 3D efforts were so rushed and, and didn't really show up too well. Um, but this one is really where the tide started to turn for a few reasons. So this is really the first like higher budget Marvel game that we got for the PS1, and it really started to turn things where... You know, there really was some money in this, um, and it, you know, was kind of kicking off the generation where all the movies started to come out as well. Um, this is the first Spider-Man game on the PS1, and if you could see, this one is not only an Activision published title, but this one was developed by Neversoft. Uh, Neversoft is the creators of the Tony Hawk franchise on the PS1, and this one actually shared um, some pieces of the Tony Hawk engine that uh, really lent well to the game design. Um, this is really also the first of these where collecting became a big part of the game. Um, they did a lot of fan service. They had classic comic book covers you could unlock, additional costumes, uh, just stills from the games, you know, videos, all those kinds of things. And it really just added a lot of replay value to the game. Uh, this one did get ported to other systems, but this was truly the uh, the original was the PS1 release, so I can tell a lot of love went into this game. Um, this game sold very well. It got a Greatest Hits version, so um, you can easily pick it up, you know, if in that version if uh, you can't find the original black label. But, um, you know, I, I just think that this really shows what happens when a little bit more care goes into these games. And the other thing I like about it is it's not directly tied to the Spider-Man movie. This actually came out before it. Um, so it kind of is its own standalone release. It's not trying to, you know, incorporate movie property into the game to uh, to make it sell. So nice that we got this, and I think uh, really set the tone for some of the other games you're going to see later on. Uh, so because that game did so well, they, of course, pumped out a sequel. <laughs> so we got Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro. Uh, what I like about this one is this is a console exclusive. So while the first one got ported to uh, a couple other systems, this one remained as a PS1-only game. Um, really, it just take, picks up right where the last game uh, left off. When you start this game, it even like recaps some of the events of the first game. So it was meant to be a direct tie between the two titles. Uh, more of the same as far as all the collecting features and you know additional costumes and all those types of things. And then I should also mention that uh, Stan Lee narrated both games. So 
you have that star power um, adding a little bit more credibility to the video game franchise as well. Um, when this one came out, the first Spider-Man uh, movie was in the theaters or coming out soon, but it didn't have a direct tie to that. They were really saving those games for like PS2 and Xbox um, and GameCube got those games. So this one, again, is just I have I have a little bit of respect for it as it's a standalone console release and an exclusive for the PS1. So it's kind of neat that it uh, exists. Um, Neversoft did not develop this one, though. That's the one downside to it. So I do think that the uh, game engine that they developed from the first game was retained. Uh, but this one was actually developed by uh, Vicarious Visions, which was kind of like the second tier <laughs> Activision uh, developer below Neversoft. So not necessarily a bad thing, but, uh, you know, this one was probably rushed a little bit more just because the uh, the essential game design had already been created from the first game and they just carried it forward with a new story and uh, new settings and things like that. So can recommend this one. And uh, I do think it's pretty cool that we got, you know, a unique franchise like this for the PS1. Uh, some other Activision titles that uh, came out. This one is movie tied in loosely. So this is X-Men Mutant Academy. Um, I am definitely an X-Men fan, so I was welcome this game when it came out. But it really felt kind of redundant because you already had the Capcom fighters, which were well established. And then the X-Men title we get is a fighting game. <laughs> so it's really just more of the same. Uh, these are 3D fighters, so that's, I guess, the one unique thing about it. Uh, but they definitely borrowed some uh, ideas from the Capcom 2D fighters, just even with some of the specials and, and moves and things like that are very indebted to the uh, Capcom games. Um, this one, again, is an Activision published title, but another team developed these games. And this is by a company called Paradox, which I'm not really familiar with. So maybe you can fill me in if they uh, went on to other things or maybe fizzled after that. Um, the collecting aspects of the Spider-Man games are very much present in this as well. Uh, you know, a lot of um, additional footage and costumes and comic book covers and things like that you can collect along the way. And um, just kind of add some additional, you know, replay value to it. Uh, I like the speed of this game. It does play very quick. The uh, load times in between stages are, are pretty fast as well, so it's easy to play just the arcade mode and um, you know pick up and play it without having to get too in-depth with it. Or if you want to get into some of the additional modes, it has a lot of uh, additional content added in it as well. Uh, the only thing I would say is kind of a downside of this one. It's, it's a little bit light on characters overall and um, just doesn't have the variety of some of the Capcom fighters as far as some of this, the uh, additional moves and things like that you can pull off. Uh, but overall, it's a decent game. This one sold very well. Also, you can get a Greatest Hits version of this one. Uh, so this one's worth getting for, you know, if it's reasonably cheap, which I think it should be in most cases. Uh, because that game did well, we got a sequel to it as well. <laughs> so this is X-Men Mutant Academy 2. Um, this one actually has some great cover art. Uh, I only wish the game was as good, and unfortunately, like, something changed about this one. The uh, overall game design and menus look I almost identical to the first X-Men uh, Mutant Academy game, but for some reason the gameplay just feels more sluggish on this one, so something changed with the fighting engine, and I'm not really sure why. Um, but it does kind of hurt the game a little bit. They did add um, more characters and, you know, more special features and whatnot uh, to keep the game fresh. I don't think this one sold nearly as well. Uh, the X-Men movies had started coming out by this point, of course, uh, but this one wasn't necessarily tied to a, directly to a movie. It's kind of its own standalone thing, which is kind of cool. Um, this one did not come out on any other platform as well, so these are also PS1 exclusives, which is kind of a nice perk to them as well. Um, but decent, you know, Paradox developed this one as well, so I don't really know what, uh, what changed necessarily with the fighting game engine, but they must have made some tweaks to it, and honestly, I would rather play the first game than this one, so... Interesting that it's out there, but not essential by any means. Uh, then we get into some more of the Capcom fighters. So this is uh, one of my favorite franchises overall. It's uh, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, which was really the first mix of the uh, Marvel characters coming into the Street Fighter franchise. This one came out before Marvel vs. Street Fighter. Um, overall, though, the PS1 version is severely limited. So <laughs> what made this game so great in the arcades and on the Sega Saturn was the tag team battles. And the PS1 just does not pull that off, or they just couldn't figure out how to code it. Um, so it's kind of like a, a very weak version that you can't do proper tag team battles in this game. Um, everyone railed on this when it first came out, and for good reason. However, this game is still incredibly expensive <laughs> for the PS1 today. Um, I think just due to the, the fandom for both you know series of characters that are out there. And uh, it is kind of a more uncommon title. It didn't really sell too well, I don't think. There's no Greatest Hits version of this or anything. 
Um, if you'll notice, this one also has the Fighter's Edge artwork on it, and there is no other version of this one either. So, kind of interesting. Um, you know, I'm happy this game exists um, for the PS1, but unfortunately, since I have the Saturn version, I would definitely not play this one, uh, because the Saturn version just really takes advantage of that 4 meg RAM cart and makes all the difference in this game. Uh, but overall, just another way that uh, some more Marvel characters made it into the PS1, so a welcome addition for that reason. And then the last game we're going to take a look at as part of the subset is probably the weirdest one of these. This is X-Men Children of the Atom. Uh, why I say this one is strange is this was actually the very first Marvel-Capcom collaboration in the arcades. Um, and really introduced the fighting game engine that all these Versus games were built on uh, that came after it. What's really strange about this PS1 release, though, is you see Capcom and Acclaim's branding on the cover. And I think truly Acclaim is who published this in the U.S., um, but Capcom obviously developed the fighting game engine. Uh, the other reason this game is super strange is it came out way later than the Saturn version. I believe the Saturn game came out in 1995, and this one came out in 1998. <laughs> so I guess they were just trying to cash in on some of the uh, popularity of the Versus fighters, but when you compare this one, it's the weakest of all of them, because it was really where the, the whole generation of Versus fighters started, and Capcom had made all these enhancements over the years uh, to, the, to the game engine. So uh, the one thing that's kind of neat about this one is you do have a nice mix of X-Men characters. I do think there's a couple that were exclusive to this title that never made it into some of the other ones. I'd have to go back and check the character list to be sure. Uh, but I do think that, you know, with the heavy X-Men focus, it had some different stuff in it that you didn't necessarily see in some of the other ones where they had to blend in all the Marvel characters. But um, overall, it's a very interesting curiosity. I think this game is pretty low print. You don't see this hardly ever. And, you know, when it did come out, it was like, why? <laughs> like most people already had some of the other games that existed in the uh, Versus series by the time this was out. Or they had the Saturn version that had been out for several years by that time. So just very strange timing on this one. Um, but that's going to wrap it up. That is all the Marvel games for the PS1, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed this look into this small subset. I just think it's interesting to talk about just because of the, um, you know, how big and broad the Marvel Universe has gotten today and all the gaming tie-ins that go with it. Um, it really was a much smaller mindset when these games came out, and uh, just like I said, really designed to please a very small fandom compared to what is out there today with the uh, the big mouse company behind the Marvel franchises. So. Hope you enjoyed this uh, this look at the small subset. Thank you for taking a look. Uh, please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. And I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.